Welcome, you found assignment four. I wanna make sure that you've done assignment one through three that I gave you when we visited together. If you haven't, or if you have forgotten exactly what they were, you can access them again at the assignment refresher page, and you can find it right here. Home-school-coach.com slash plan dash support. I'll give you just a minute to write that down. If you happened on this page accidentally as you were doing an internet search, welcome. We're glad to have you here too. And you can find out a little bit more what the, what these assignments are and how they're supposed to help you at that link that I just gave you. I want you to know that today I don't have a printed script. <clears throat> It's just you and I sitting together in my kitchen. Yes, we are in my kitchen. And I didn't dress up for you, although I did brush my hair a little bit. Because I want to talk to you from my heart about a topic that I think is really important. And that is that you can change. No matter where you are in your life, you can change. I myself have had this experience where I've worked on something and I just fall off the wagon and I get discouraged and I think I just cannot change. This is who I am, this is my personality, and I'm kind of stuck. I gave you three assignments to help you change. That is the point of living our lives, is to become better human beings, better parents, better friends, better people than we would be if we didn't do any work. And I am here to tell you that you can change, so that's the topic. As I said, I don't have a printed script. What I do have are some notes for myself, just an outline, because I am 63, and sometimes words escape me or thoughts fly away and I have a senior moment or two. And so these are to help me. So if I look down, I want you to forgive me. This video is not about perfection. I'm not having it edited. I'm not spending a lot of time making it look perfect. I want you to understand that mothers, and that's what you are and what I am, or maybe you're even a dad. Maybe you're not there yet and you're a person who's planning on it. We're just regular people living regular lives, trying our best to do a good job. And I'm gonna do my best today on this video to do a good job for you, but I am not striving for perfection. So up front, I'm letting you know that, and I want you to forgive any things in here that you think should be better because I know there are better ways to do everything. My goal today is to help you uh, do some important work for the sake of your family and yourself to just feel better about life. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is why is change so difficult? We know that it is because New Year's resolutions are a really good example of how we say, man, I'm gonna eat less this year, I'm gonna yell less, I'm gonna keep my laundry done, and we have this list of things, and by March, we're not doing them, we're not seeing success. So the first thing to think about is why is it so challenging for people to make change? And I'm gonna give you three things that I think are pivotal in that. They're from my perspective, and I hope that they'll ring true to you. And the first one is that there are a lot of lies out there. Now, being a religious person and of the Christian faith, whether you are or not doesn't matter, but from my perspective, it's that Satan lies. He tells us things like, we can't change, it's too hard, you're a loser, it's too late, you're too old, it's taking too long, God doesn't love you, and a myriad other reasons why we can't change. And the unfortunate thing is that we buy into it. It doesn't matter if you just believe in the energy of the universe or your neighbor may be the person who tells you you can't change or maybe it's your mother or your father or a sibling. The point here is that we have people and beliefs in our life that keep us stuck and we buy into those. So that is, I think, one of the number one reasons and we could extend that a little bit farther that we have negative thoughts about ourselves that we have bought into since we were children, that we're not smart enough, we're not good enough in some way to be what in our deep heart we wanna be. 
Second is incorrect beliefs, both spiritual and temporal. Things we believe about how life works, how families work, how discipline works, how education works, or spiritual. Uh, who we are at the deepest core of ourselves. And three, and this one is really important to learn because if you can understand this and start applying it, it will change your life. And that is stimulus response. For most of us, the space between the stimulus and our response is really, really small. So I'm gonna give you an example and I'm gonna use an example from my life and that is yelling. I was really a yeller. In fact, I would say sometimes it bordered on raging when I was younger. And I would think to myself, it just happens. There's nothing I can do about it. I, I decide I'm not gonna yell and then something happens and wow, it just, it just happens. Well, I'm here to tell you that everything you say, think, and do, there's a, a moment of choice behind it. Now, you may not believe it, and that's okay. When I first learned this, I didn't believe it myself. But I'm here to tell you that is true. And for me, my the space between the stimulus, whatever made me upset, and the response was virtually nil. And so for me, it felt like the same thing. Stimulus response, firecracker going off. But once I learned this principle and I internalized it, I was able, over time, to extend the space between the stimulus and the response. And the value in that for me was it gave me time to choose what I was going to do. If it feels to you like you have no control in the moment, I want you to understand that there is. It's just an issue of you expanding the space between the stimulus and the response. Now there are tools to help people do that and if you go searching for them, you can find them. But for right now, what is important is for you to plant that seed inside of yourself and allow it to grow until you can accept it and believe it that you have choice. You are choosing how to respond in every situation even if it doesn't feel like you are. So to summarize why it's so hard for people to change three things. You hear lies about change that you accept that make it difficult for you to change. You have a lot of internal incorrect beliefs about change that keep you stuck. And the space between your stimulus and your response needs a lot of work. Now, the second thing that I think is really important for people who want to make significant change in their life is you have got to understand what does it look like when you're making progress towards change. So here's what a lot of us think, and this is how I used to think. So I make a decision that I'm not going to yell anymore. And then I have a long night with the baby. I only get a couple of hours of sleep, and those are very interrupted. I'm feeling really out of sorts and crabby when I wake up. And when I go into the kitchen, I find that my five-year-old has tried to get himself a cup of chocolate milk, and there is a puddle all over the kitchen floor. Wham! I'm yelling at my child because now I have a mess that I have to clean up. And so this is what I do. I clean up the mess. I'm yelling the whole time. I'm feeling really frustrated. The child's standing there with, you know, the look on their face because their intention was to independently get chocolate milk and they per felt perfectly capable of doing it and they weren't waking us up. Now, three minutes later, five minutes later, 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, I'm replaying that situation in my brain and I'm feeling like a lousy person. I'm telling myself, oh, you're so bad. You weren't gonna yell anymore and look at this. You didn't even last one day and you're already yelling. And now you've set the stage for how you're gonna feel the rest of the day. 
and the rest of the week about yourself. But I'm telling you, you have missed something really important. There are three steps to change and you cannot skip any of them. And the first one is what you just experienced. You make a decision about something you want to change and then you mess up. And after you mess up, you recognize, oh, that isn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to do this instead. Instead of beating yourself up over, over that, what I want you to do is celebrate and say, yes, I'm on my way to change. Because that's where you are. That is the first step. You become aware that something needs to change. You make a decision you're going to change. And then you are going to mess up. And then you're going to realize, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do this instead. That my friends, is a moment for celebration. Now, yes, you feel bad that your little five-year-old's heart is hurt and wounded. But what I want you to do is celebrate. Yes, I'm making progress. I know what I need to do. And then you go get your five-year-old. You wrap your arms around them and say, you know what? I'm sorry I was crabby. I had a long night. The baby was awake and I just wasn't myself. I appreciate that you didn't wake me up and that you were doing your best to take care of breakfast. And then go on with your day. Till the next time you screw up, you yell again, you say something you didn't mean to say or you do something you planned on not doing. And the moment you recognize, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do this instead. I want you to celebrate because that is step one in what change actually looks like. So what does step two look like? Well, you make a decision that you're not going to yell anymore. Same scenario. You walk into the kitchen, tired, a little grouchy, out of sorts, from not getting enough sleep, and there's a puddle of chocolate milk on the floor, and this is what it looks like. John, what? And you get a rag, and you clean up the mess you fall into the old behavior but you catch yourself in the behavior and you stop that's what step two looks like so what does step three look like it looks like this same scenario long night not enough sleep puddle of chocolate milk on the kitchen floor you walk into the kitchen and you go oh my gosh I so don't need this today. Oh well. And you get a cloth and you clean it up. Then you call John in and you say, John, I know you didn't want to wake me up and that you wanted to get your own breakfast, but I think you still need help with chocolate milk. So the next time you want chocolate milk, even if I'm sleeping, I want you to come and get me and ask for help. So, those are the three steps. What change actually looks like in three steps? One, you mess up. You recognize you messed up and you say, ah, okay, this is what I wanted to do instead. Yes, I'm making progress. Two, you mess up, catch yourself in the middle and stop. And three, whoops. You walk in, you think about messing up, and you don't. You make a different choice. It all has to do with the fact that the stimulus and the response, the space in between them has changed for you. Now this takes time. Sometimes it takes more time than we want to give it. And later, uh, as we talk, I'm going to share a story with you to illustrate that you must give yourself time. And this will not work for you if you cannot celebrate step one. And step one, I want you to remember, you will mess up. And then you will realize you messed up. And that is the moment in which I want you to celebrate. Yes, I am making progress. Because before you messed up and you just went on. You just went on. You had no intention of changing. You didn't stop and think about it. Even if you felt lousy, it was different. Now you have an intention for change 
and you are working on it. Now the third set that I want to talk about is three principles to assist you in making change. So let's be real. Change isn't easy. If it were, we would all be doing it more often. We would all be living happier lives, be more calm, uh, weigh less, exercise more. We would all be doing things a lot differently. But change is difficult. And people start into change and they feel the difficulty of it and they let it go. And so I want to give you three principles which will assist you in making change. And the first one is faith. Now, I've already mentioned being a Christian person, I would place my faith in the person of Jesus Christ. I would say to myself, because he's there, because he can help me, I know I can change. I have faith that I can change. Some people have faith in the energy of the universe and others have faith in themselves that because they're human, because they have a mind and they can think, they can change. This is faith at work. Regardless of how it manifests in your life, you have to have faith that you can change, that you can grow, that how you are and who you are is not set in stone. Number two, awareness. This is really important because we spend a lot of time in our lives beating ourselves up over our weaknesses. But let me tell you, if you do not recognize a weakness, you cannot change it. You must be aware of where change needs to happen. Now let's go back to the yelling, raging scenario, which I can speak to from experience because I was there. I grew up in a home where yelling was a common occurrence. In fact, not just in my personal home, but in my family of origin at reunions, wherever. I heard it a lot, lots of yelling, lots of just people not being quite in control. It seemed like a normal way that people were to me. It's all that I had experience with. Now, when I married and started having children, when my youngest daughter, my oldest daughter was three years old, I had two children, was probably close to being pregnant with the third, and I realized something is not right. I knew my daughter was struggling in some way. I couldn't put my finger on what it was, but I knew she was distressed. A few years later, it came to my mind because I'm a seeker and like you, am tr have spent a lifetime growing and changing. I kept looking for answers and it occurred to me that the way I responded in situations with my children was causing some difficulty. And I thought to myself, I don't think yelling is the way to do this. It took me a full 10 years to get to the place where I actually accepted the fact that not everyone yelled. It wasn't the best way to resolve problems and that there might be a different way. And a most embarrassing thing happened um, one day, my neighbor who happened to be a nurse and she didn't just live next to my house, she lived across the street from me, came over with a little pamphlet on anger management. And when she went home, I said to my husband, what was that all about? What, is, what was she bringing this over here for? This is the weirdest thing ever. But I took the pamphlet in and based on the, the past that I'd been thinking maybe um, how I behaved wasn't exactly the best, I started really thinking about that and thought to myself, well, obviously there must be another way to manage life. And from that point, I really went on a search. How do I make this change? How do I uh, be different, respond differently? And that's when I learned the principles I'm teaching you today line upon line, precept on a precept, a little here and a little there. Now today, at 63, I am not a yeller. Raging is about as far away from me as anything. And just normal yelling. I just really don't do it. <clears throat> I can at times be a little intense, but I really have a handle on it. But it took 
time. It took time. And in any of those intervening years, had I given up, it would have been over for me. So I want you to know that when you have a weakness, celebrate. When you recognize a weakness, I want you to celebrate because now you can do something about it. Most of us, when we recognize a weakness, we immediately start beating ourselves off about it. And not only that, we tell other people, well, I'm just no good at. I'm never going to be able to. Stop that. Stop it. When you recognize a weakness, celebrate. Say, yes, now I know the next thing to work on. I can change this. I just need the proper tools and the proper information, and then you go on a search. Also in awareness, I want to talk about a couple of things that were difficult for me to accept. And I'm going to talk about them not because all of you who listen to this fall into this category, but because I've done enough personal mentoring, I know that many of you do. And that is, you are not a victim. I don't care what has happened to you in your life. And trust me when I say this, I've had difficult things happen in my life as a child and as an adult. I've had some serious things to deal with. I'm speaking to you from experience and I'm telling you, no matter what has happened to you, you are not a victim. But it's easy to become a victim, to think we're victims. And when we fall into that place, it's difficult to maintain hope. Victims have a hard time believing that they can change, that life can be better for them. They have a difficult time taking responsibility for whatever is happening in their lives and they tend to blame others. And I'm going to tell you right now that if you are in that victim space, the first thing you need to do is get out. I lived in that victim space all of my childhood and youth and well into my adult years. I'm speaking from experience. I want you to be clearly understand that you listening at home cannot say to yourself, well, it's easy for her to say. She hasn't had blah, 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 whatever it is. I probably have. I probably have. And I got myself a mentor um, who had also been a victim and had felt like a victim for much of her life. But she had gotten herself out of that victim place. I went to her and I said, I want to do what you've done. I want to be free. And she helped me over about a six year period of time to work all that out. Now I didn't mentor with her every week or every month of those six years. Periodically I would go back to her and we'd work on something new. And the phrase that she would say to me regularly was, Marianne, you are not a victim. So when you become aware of a weakness, I want you to check it out. Do I feel like a victim? Is this what is causing me to behave the way I do and poorly? The second thing is, is if there's a problem, it's your problem. Now, I'm going to share a story with you. I'm being really bluntly honest with you because I can give you all the assignments in the world. You can go to conventions, classes, you can read books. But until you can accept that you are not a victim, that you have choice in this life, and that if there's a problem, it's your problem, you are going to have difficulty applying what you learn in any significant way to create change. So in my adult life, I had someone do something that uh, caused me a lot of grief. Now, I didn't know they had done this thing. All I knew was that I suffered a consequence which I thought I brought upon myself. Well, let me go back. I was sitting in a church class one day, and the teacher said, if there's a problem, it's your problem. I was young then, a young mother, and that statement infuriated me so much. I went home and just stewed on it. It made me so mad. 
But every time something would go a lot wrong in my life from then on, I would hear in my mind, well, if there's a problem, it's your problem. And I would be re-infuriated because I didn't believe it. I couldn't accept it. No, it isn't my fault. It isn't my problem. It's my husband did it or my kids did it or my neighbor did it or whatever. I couldn't accept that if there was a problem, it was my problem. And I'll tell you, this was about the same time that I was trying to understand why I yelled and how to stop that. But, but I knew there was a better way. So we're talking the same 10-year period. I stewed on that statement for 10 years. One day, I clearly remember in the kitchen. Now back to the story. Someone had done something which caused me to suffer a consequence for many years. And then one day, I discovered the whole of the story and I realized oh, it was, I didn't do it, but I suffered the consequence. And I was so angry at this person who was very close to me. It was a relationship that mattered significantly that it was imperative I not walk away from or destroy. But I was so angry, I could barely contain it. I was standing in the kitchen washing dishes. And I remember thinking about this. Well, if there's a problem, it's your problem and feeling that same old sensation of anger that it couldn't be true because really in the situation I'm sharing, I was completely and totally innocent. I remember slamming my fist down on the counter and saying out loud to God, if it's my problem, you'll have to show me how it's my problem because I'm innocent. And immediately this thought came into my mind, your response is the problem. That was a life-changing moment for me. I knew in that moment that it was true. If I was experiencing a difficulty of any kind, it was my difficulty, it was my problem, and I could solve it. I realized in that moment I can't change the past. I can't change what this person did. I can't change the suffering I've gone through. What I can change is how I'm going to feel now. I can choose to continue to suffer and be angry and hold on to the consequence, or I can let it go. I am not a victim. I have a choice. And that has made all the difference in my life. Third, stay the course. Most of us get stuck and begin to believe that we can't do it anymore. Whatever it is we're trying to change is taking too long. It's too hard. It requires more than we've got to give. I told you the story of taking 10 years to go from not knowing that raging and yelling was not okay to just thinking that maybe it wasn't okay and I needed to change and then time after that to actually make the change. How many times in that do you think I said to myself, you're never going to change. You can't do this. You're just mean. I said it and I thought it. But what I believed more than that was this. That I was made for greater things. I had faith in myself. I had faith in my creator. I had faith and hope. And I never quit. And it took all that time. But I changed it. I do not yell anymore. My youngest daughter, bless her heart, she's seven years younger than the next youngest. She was born when I was 40 years old. And she has a habit of saying to me, Mom, you're so intense. Now, her older siblings, the six older than her, laugh. They say, oh my gosh, you just don't know. Because they lived with one mother and she lived with another. So I know that regardless of how long it takes, it's worth the effort. It's worth the change because I've been yelling free for 20 years. That's a long time. 
to live a more peaceful, calm, managed life. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful I didn't quit. I want you not to give up until a change of heart occurs. That's what you're doing here. You're changing your way of being. You're changing your heart. These things do not generally happen overnight. They're a process. They take time. Now, when I was mentoring with the woman who was helping me uh, learn to not yell, she would remind me. I would, I would, we would talk in the call. She would remind me, you're not a victim. You do have choice. You can change. Everything you need is within you. You just need a few tools, a little accountability, some support. You can do this. And at the end of the calls, I remember consistently crying. And it was embarrassing because she was way, way younger than me. And I'll be honest, she was my daughter. And I think to myself, she would say to me, Mom, why are you crying? And I'd say, well, because I'm the mother. I should know this. And she would say to me, why should you know this? Your experience has been different than mine. I've had some opportunities you haven't had. And I'd say, but... I'm older, I should have figured this out sooner. And she would say to me, why should you have? It takes what it takes. You know, I occasionally mentor with her still, uh, sometimes on business things, sometimes personal things. Uh, she's been a great help to me. I don't cry anymore. I realize that the greatness of my soul is evidenced in my willingness to continue to work on things until I figure them out. The greatness of my soul is not demonstrated by my errors and my mistakes and the passage of time. It is demonstrated by my heart, my willingness to work. But that is not what we believe most often. We beat ourselves up because it's taking too long. We have this weakness in the first place. We have a lot of negative thoughts about ourselves. I want you to stop. The greatness of your soul is demonstrated that you're listening to assignment four. That if nothing else, you're listening to this and you're going to plant it in your heart and you're going to let it grow and it will over time change you. That is the greatness of your soul. That's what demonstrates it. Not that you yelled this morning over the chocolate milk. So, three principles that will assist you in making change. One, faith. You have to have faith that it is possible, that you can do this. Two, you have got to be aware of your weaknesses. You cannot change what you don't know. So when you find a weakness, celebrate. It's the next step for you. And three, stay the course as long as it takes to make a change. Don't give up. Don't quit. Now for some of you, the assignments that you got from me will be the first steps you have consciously made towards real personal change. Good for you. Keep using these tools and if you're a praying person, add prayer and you will see that your beliefs, attitudes and behaviors will begin to shift. Others of you have been working on making change for a long time and have found some success although you may be still struggling with things. But you are looking and you continue to learn and grow and change. Hallelujah for you. Others of you are seasoned personal growers like me. You have done enough work that when you hit the wall, you rub your nose, get up, and look for tools and solutions because you know they are out there and you know you can change because you have experienced it. That's where I am in my life. In the last few years, I have chosen to work with many different mentors to help me move to even greater heights in many different areas of my life. Greater heights than I might have been able to achieve without their help. Choosing a mentor, someone to help you along your road to personal growth, is a noble and mature step to take. 
When you are beginning to, beginning to make changes, we tend to choose friends, family, and a few good books for our mentors. After all, a mentor is, can be anyone that has accomplished what you're trying to accomplish. For those of you who are new to personal, the personal growth arena, I might suggest a couple of books that can help you open your eyes to new ideas and help you see things in a new way. Now I know you're going to want to write them down, so I've got them right here for you. Uh, let's see. The Anatomy of Peace by the Arbinger Institute. As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. Raving Fans by Ken Blanchard. And I'm going to hold this up for just a minute so you can write those down if you're interested in mentoring with a book. The Anatomy of Peace by the Arbinger Institute. As a Man Thinketh by James Allen and Raving Fans by Ken Blanchard. Now, I want you to know that when I was a young girl, uh, first I want to say that my family of origin, although we yelled, was really a wonderful family. Um, my dad was a great educator and a great learner. And the book, As a Man Thinketh, came into my life early, I maybe ninth grade. And so when I say that I've learned line upon line and precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, I'm not kidding about that. When you're searching, what you need will come to you. Now, I was far too young in ninth grade to really assimilate all that book. But what happened is seeds were planted and over time they grew. And so that was one of the earliest books on change or that, that I have choice, that I'm in control of how my life looks it was as early as ninth grade. The book, um, The Anatomy of Peace by the Arbinger Institute came late in my life. I was well into my 50s and I got that book for my daughter who I was mentoring with. It was a book that had changed her life. And the book Raving Fans actually is a business book, but I would suggest it for any parent because what it's about is the 1% principle. That change happens 1% at a time. So a mistake that many of us make is that we have this whole list of things that just need to be changed. And it's daunting and we get tired and we quit. But if you can find the correct 1% to work on, it can magnificently make changes in your life that you couldn't even imagine. So I really enjoyed the book, Raving Fans by Ken Blanchard. All righty. Now, at the bottom of this page, below the video, you're gonna see three buttons. Button one, which is on the left, is for those of you who want to continue working on your own to create a culture of peace, connection, and love of learning in your families. Button two is in the middle, and it's for those of you who want, want a little help from a great support group with a seasoned mentor. Some of the things that that support group will be discussing is how to make personal changes that will help you stop feeling like a victim, how to change the way you look at and have money in your life, increasing your energy, establishing more harmony in your personal and family relations, and other topics which apply to a group. However, if you want to make significant, accelerated change, then choose button three. A week from now, when you yell, or you feel discouraged, or you do something wrong, I want you to remember that you can change. You do not have to remain the same. Change is possible for everyone, even you. A year from now, when you have given it everything you have and you think there isn't any more to give and you want to quit, I want you to remember that you don't have to stay where you are. Change is possible for everyone, even you. One of my favorite scriptures out of my own personal canon, the Christian Bible, is found in Mark chapter 9, verse 23. 
If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible to him that believeth. Even change, overcoming weaknesses, changing our way of being, becoming a new person. It is possible. When I was a young girl, I read a book by Viktor Frankl. He spent a significant amount of time in a concentration camp. Life was really difficult and hard there. I love this quote by him. When you are no longer able to change a situation, you are challenged to change yourself. I want you to accept that you can change, no matter what has happened to you in the past, no matter what your life looks like today, whether it's overeating, binging, yelling, depression, not enjoying being a mom or dad, trouble at work, financial trouble. It doesn't matter. It absolutely doesn't matter. There are tools that you can apply to change everything in your life. Go out there, continue searching, continue looking, make a change. Choose a method that will help you change, whether it's reading a good book, visiting with a family or a friend who has accomplished what you want, taking a course on your own, mentoring with a group, or mentoring personally with someone who's done what you want to do. Choose one and just get started and do it. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for forgiving any mistakes or errors in this video. Thank you for being willing to learn and walk this uh, short journey with me. Have a good day.